Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, I'm Dr. Shazad Khan. I'm one of the senior consultant uh, radiologists working uh, presently in uh, Walsall Healthcare NHS Trust. Today's uh, topic of discussion is uh, the new prostate cancer pathway, and I'm going to talk about uh, the multi-parametric MRI. I've uh, basically uh, divided the talk into three segments. So the first segment will talk about the basic anatomy of the prostate gland and uh, the zonal anatomy. And we are going to talk a little bit about the prostate specific antigen and uh, a bit about the pathology because it's very important to understand uh, what uh, the new pathway actually entails. And then in the second half of the discussion, we will talk about the various imaging modalities that we used to diagnose prostate cancer. And during the last half of the talk, it would be more about the current pathway and what is the proposed new pathway. So as we know, the prostate gland is basically a pyramidal structure which sits uh, between the bladder base and the urogenital diaphragm. The apex touches the urogenital diaphragm and the base actually abuts uh, the neck of the bladder. It has the prostatic urethra which traverses through the middle of the gland and also the ejaculatory ducts which are formed by the vas deferens and the duct of the seminal vesicle also join the uh, prostatic urethra. And then uh, quickly anteriorly, you have the retropubic space uh, there. Posteriorly, you have the back passage or the rectal tube. We talk about the anatomy of the prostate in terms of uh, the lobar anatomy, which is again, the arbitrary dividing line is the prostatic urethra. So you have the anterior part of the gland anterior to the urethra on the sagittal section. And the posterior part lies actually behind the ejaculatory duct and between the prostatic urethra and the ejaculatory duct you have the median lobe. On the axial slices, the cut section, you have the anterior part of the gland anteriorly, the posterior part posteriorly and in the middle part you have the median lobe which is actually as you can see lying behind the urethra and you have the lateral part of the glands on either side of the urethra. The zonal anatomy of the prostate is very important. This is the nomenclature that we commonly used amongst the radiologist, the uh, urologist, and also the pathologist. And what it does is that, that as we know, the prostate is a, uh, basically comprises of 70% of glandular tissue and 30% of the fibromuscular stroma. So if you look at this slide, again, you can see the pyramidal shaped prostate. You have the apex down, the base posteriorly, where you have the seminal vesicle and the vast difference coming. And imagine that you're cutting a slice through the apex. So this slide here, you can see the peripheral zone uh, nicely uh, on the outer border of the prostate. Then you have the transitional zone, which is in yellow. And anteriorly, you have a bit of anterior fibromuscular stroma. If you take a section through the mid of the prostate gland, which is this section around here, you can see uh, peripheral zone again surrounding the prostate, uh, the periphery transitional zone, and then you have the anterior fibromuscular stroma. And then the slices just at the back, where the, close to the seminal vesicle, here again you can see that the peripheral zone is just about, in, about to disappear. You have the central zone, which has the ejaculatory ducts on either side, and the transitional zone with the fibromuscular stroma. The peripheral zone contributes around 70% of the glandular tissue, the central zone 25%, and the transitional zone is around 5%. A little bit about the normal gland. So the normal gland weighs around 20 to 40 grams. The normal dimensions are three by four by two centimeter. And if you need to take the volume of the gland, you just times the three figures with 0.52 and that will give you the volume of the gland. And the volume of the gland, normal gland, is somewhere between 25 to 30 mils. And anything which is above 30 mils is then considered as a large gland. 70% is glandular, 30% is fibromuscular. It's important that the glandular part of the prostate secretes fluid, which is the seminal fluid, and that is alkaline. And the purpose of this fluid is actually to lubricate the urethra uh, in preparation of the, um, the ejaculate which follows the urethral tube. And it also uh, tends to neutralize the acidity of uh, the vagina where eventually the ejaculate is going to be delivered. And the fibromuscular stroma on the other hand also actually acts as a muscle. So it helps to propel 
the semen um, out of the urethra. The distribution of prostate cancer is important to know which part of the gland uh, the cancer uh, basically occurs most and 70% of the cancer that you can see on the slide arises in the peripheral zone, 20% in the transitional zone and 10% the cancer arises in the central zone. Central zone is a bit tricky area to detect the cancer because it's a small part of the gland. It often uh, gets compressed by the hypertrophy of the central proportion of the gland. And therefore the uh, changes, there's a lot of signal overlap in this area and it's a tricky area to detect the cancer. Now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about uh, prostate specific antigen and therefore it's important actually to know, uh, to understand when we are dealing with the prostate cancer. So PSA is basically a protein which is secreted by both the normal prostate as well as the cancer cell. It is detected in the blood. And uh, uh, there is the important thing to understand is that, that there's no specific normal or abnormal PSA range. The level of PSA varies uh, a lot between a man and a different uh, uh, part. And uh, what is more important is the persistently elevated PSA, which is alarming. So if somebody has got a PSA which is persistently elev elevated, and that has to be investigated. Uh, if you look in the slide, uh, the PSA levels mentioned here is uh, from four to 10, which is uh, the unit is nanogram per ml. And anybody who's got a PSA in this range is basically a bit suspicious because they may harbor a chance of having cancer in 25% of uh, cases. The PSA level, if it goes above 10, again is uh, considered as a dangerous level because 50% of these patients may have a prostate cancer. When we say that there is no specific normal or abnormal PSA range, what we may mainly mean from this is that, that patients can have absolutely normal PSA level, but still they can have a cancer. And patients can have very high level of PSA, will not have cancer. So this slide shows you that 15% of men with prostate cancer can have normal PSA. So this means that the PSA testing is really unreliable because of the false positives and the false negative. So you can't rely uh, just let alone on this one diagnostic test. And uh, uh, the other important thing is that, that there are a number of conditions which are uh, non-cancerous, for instance, prostatitis, uh, urine tract infections, patients who have had recent dental rectal examination, or patients who have got uh, uh, prostate biopsies, all those patients will then also have an elevated PSA level. So PSA screening, which means that to use PSA as a test to detect cancer is therefore controversial in the medical literature and the medical community. Because if you uh, just let alone diagnose patients on the basis of raised PSA or even start their investigation, you tend to over-diagnose some of these patients because not all prostate cancers, as we go along in the later of the talk, I will tell you that not all prostate cancers are going to behave in the same fashion and they're aggressive. So you tend to overtreat some of these patients. It's also important to know a little bit about the pathological grading of these cancers because to understand uh, the uh, imaging and also to understand the implications of uh, the grading um, as a, a prognostic tool. The pathological grading of the prostate cancers is basically done by the Gleason grading system or more recently by the Epstein grading system. Uh, I'll talk first about the Gleason grading system and what it does in the Gleason grading system is that basically the grading system of the cancer is important for the optimal treatment and we take random biopsies of the prostate normally with the trans ultrasound, that's around 12 uh, uh, cores that we take. And the grading system is based on the number of cancer cells found in these cores of the biopsies, how many cores are positive, and what percentage of cancer is within each core. So based on this, we may have a various subtypes of the grading system, which I'll talk about in a minute. Just very briefly, the Epstein grading, which has been developed new, uh, recently by folks in um, John Hopkins. And this has tried to simplify the complex Gleason grading system from one to five. 
The Gleason grading was introduced in 1966 and is based on the architectural pattern of the tumor. The grading system is based from one to five, depending on the aggressiveness of the tumor. Grade one, two, and three are pretty much normal uh, looking prostate. So on this slide, uh, if you see the Gleason pattern, and these are the cells. So they are fairly from one to three are normal looking cells. They are grade four Gleason and grade five, which are more abnormal looking cells. So just to give you an, sort of an insight about more of this grading is that, for instance, if you take in a sample, and if you look here, the grading is done uh, on numerical value. So you have two numerical values here, which are added together to give you a score. So in this slide, if you have three plus four, it means that the bulk of the cancer within the score is grade three. The second uh, less common type is grade four. On the other hand, you have another scoring system of four plus three, which is also equal to seven. But here, the first numerical contributes to the commonest cell type, cancer cell type, which is grade four here. And the less common type is grade three. So if you look at both of them, the score is the same, but four plus three is a higher cancer type because predominantly the cancer cells there are more of four type as opposed to type three. The Gleason growth six, which is three plus three, is a very low category of cancer, which is a very favorable outcome, if, uh, if I may say so. Whereas the Gleason grade uh, of nine or 10 are bad prognostic factor. They are more aggressive tumors. I've shown you this slide again. So coming back to the pathological gra grading, the issue with the uh, biopsies that we take uh, and the urologists take is that that we take random biopsies and therefore we can miss a cancer of a high grade. Image guided biopsies on the other hand are more precise, which we are gonna talk about later in the discussion. It's also impact important uh, uh, to understand that the slides should be reviewed accurately by an expert pathologist because what we have seen is that, that the Gleason score can change if uh, the pathology slides are reviewed by an expert pathologist and this will then have an impact on the treatment. So each of these numerical grades, which is grade three, grade four, grade five, grade six, they're very distinct. And what I mean from that is that, that when we say that we should have a prostate cancer and we say it is Gleason six, then it doesn't mean that, that you know, it is basically an aggressive cancer because like I said, grade six is defined as hardly a cancer, as grade time, 10 is a more aggressive cancer. You have to also understand what is a clinically significant prostate cancer. And a significant prostate cancer is something which has got a high Gleason score of seven or more, where a tumor volume is more than 0.5 mil. And that is detected via within the core of the sample that we take. That has got extra prostatic extension on the MRI. And when we take the targeted biopsies, which is via the imaging, via the MRI, we actually are detecting more high-risk cancers and we're detecting lower, uh, 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 less percentage of low-risk cancer. A clinically insignificant cancer is one which has got a recent score of six and less and the way the tumor volume is less than 0.5. Low-grade lesions are actually Gleason 6 or practically speaking less. They are not regarded as basically a malignant because if you look at the evolution of these tumors, they don't tend to metastasize. They will not become aggressive if you even leave them for 10 to 15 years. So we don't need to actually diagnose them in the first place or neither treat them because the treatment of these cancers, of a low grade cancer, treatment comes with its own toxicity. So just quickly, we will go through with some of the cancer prostate statistics here in UK. So around 48,000, roughly 48,000 men are diagnosed each year with cancer. By 2030, the number is expected to reach up to 63,000. The incidence is highest in males, the age range of 75 to 79 years, more in black men than Caucasian or Asian around 11,714 cancer deaths per year, and the, and the survival is 84% for 10 or more years. And this uh, has been taken from the Cancer Research UK registry. 
This slide is important because it shows you the amount of money expend, expenditure uh, spent on the diagnosis, the treatment, and the five-year follow-up cost per patient for prostate cancer. And this is just inclusive of the European countries. So you can see here the UK, the average cost per patient is 7,000 British pounds, as opposed to Germany, which is 13,000, France, around about 11,000, Italy, Spain is 9,000, and USA, it's around 23,000 US dollars. So it's a huge economic burden to actually diagnose, treat, and follow up these patients. The imaging modalities, this is important, that what are the imaging modalities that we use to diagnose these cancers? We use the ultrasound, which we call the transrectal ultrasound. It has got a low sensitivity, which means that if you see something, we cannot be 100% sure that this is a cancer because it could be prostate Titus or it could be a cancer, but it helps in actually uh, identifying the lesion. So it can help in uh, guiding or giving us a roadmap to take the a roadmap to take the biopsies and can be helpful in focal therapies. The next modality is CT scanning, and it is good to look for uh, metastatic disease, to look for the nodal staging. The multi-parametric MRI it's excellent for detection for local staging and for treatment planning. Radiant light bone scan, this is something that not a lot of centers are doing these days. And this is like a bone scan, so you inject a radiant light substance into one of the arm veins. It's the substance normally is technician 99 MDP, and it gets deposited in the bone at the side where the cancer tissue is. SPECT, which is used more uh, single photon imaging computer tomography. And what it does is that it combines the functional element uh, or functional imaging and it fuses it with the anatomical imaging, which I'll show you later in the, in the slide. So what we, you do with the SPECT is that you inject the radionuclide substance as you do in the radionuclide bone scan, but at the same time, you do a CT scan to match the two areas. MRI, which is the diffusion rated MRI, is very good because if you want to rule out bony metastasis, you can do it with bone scan as well, but it involves radiation. You can do it with SPECT, but again, it involves radiation. With the whole body diffusion MRI, MRI doesn't involve any radiation and is less invasive, so you can get the same information with this. Obviously, you require a specific equipment, normally a three Tesla MRI. So it's a what we call resource heavy, but other than that, if you have the equipment available, this is the best modality to look for bony metastasis. FDG PET, PET scan has been used. Um, I've put it here as a limited use because um, the bone lesion sometimes may not be very clearly seen, but you can see the nodal disease and the primary tumor very well. And we use the choline PET, uh, which is again, another kind of PET, but we use choline um, uh, at this, the C choline 11 or the F choline. And choline is a substance which is basically normally present in the cell membranes of the cells. And the prostate cancer cells, they have an affinity actually to trap choline. So the cancer cells take up that choline and they becomes readily visible on the scans. So this is just a slide to show you the uh, ultrasound images. And here you can see the probe in the rectum, and that's the prostate, and you can see a focal abnormality in the prostate gland, which can be a cancer. But this is how it looks on ultrasound transrectal. That's a CT scan, and this shows you multiple liver metastasis, and also show you the nodal disease in the parietic region. So very good for staging of the disease. The imagery on the left-hand side is a bone scan, and here you can see uh, multiple areas of uptake in the calvarium skull, in the axial spine, and the ribs, as well as the pelvis. And this is how the bone scan will look in a patient who's got disseminated bone disease. On the right-hand side, you have the diffusion-rated MRI. And I will just briefly show you this image where you can see all these bright areas within the bone marrow. These are consistent with extensive bony metastasis. The SPECT, and remember that I told you that you basically give the uh, radionuclide substance, you inject that. And here you have an example where you have the CT, which is showing you uh, some hypertrophy of the facet joints. But when you injected the contrast and you fuse the two images, you can see clearly an area which has lighted up here 
and this is the area of abnormality or a suspected metastasis. Again, the PET scan, you can see a normal CT. You can't make out where the tumor is. When you inject, you can see a tubular area of increase uptake within the prostate. And just uh, mind you that this is some excreted um, uh, contrast with the bladder. So that's not the tumor, but here you can clearly see where the tumor is, which you cannot see on a normal CT scan. And this is an example of choline PET. Choline is very uh, good uh, in detecting recurrent prostate cancers. And uh, uh, this is the modality of choice. And here you can see a triangular area of increase uptake in the prostate, which is the primary prostate cancer. You can see the nodal metastasis, which is along the left pelvic side wall and the obturator chain. And at the same time, you can see extensive metastasis in the sacrum and the left eyelid point. So we talk about the other investigations that we use to diagnose uh, in terms of imaging. So we also diagnose these patients with a transrectal ultrasound biopsy. This slide just shows you the number of men undergoing transrectal ultrasound gastric biopsies in the UK, around 150,000 men, which is a huge number, and roughly 1 million, which when you talk about in Europe and in the USA. Uh, as a diagnostic test, it has poor attributes. And the reason being is that, that these biopsies are taken often randomly. Therefore, we basically detect indolent cancers because we are just uh, shooting in the dark, as uh, we call it. Significant cancers are mixed, missed, uh, which are located in the anterior part of the gland or in the apical part of the gland or sometimes in the medial part of the gland. And therefore, the cancers are inappropriately risk stratified. And what it means is that this is just to show you how we do the transrectal biopsy. So you have an ultrasound probe, which you insert into the back passage, which is a rectum. And it just goes and sits nicely where the prostate gland is. And if you look on these images here, again, you can see, if I just bring this window down, and in these images, you can clearly see that this is a scenario where you have taken a random prostate biopsy. And this is the cancer which was missed because simply you didn't hit the area. Another example where you can see same cancers located anteriorly, but your biopsy guns have actually taken biopsy of an area where the cancer was not there, so completely missed this cancer. And the last scenario where you have gone and taken the biopsies, but the cancer was missed between the needle uh, tract, and because we were taking random biopsies. So uh, in summary, sampling errors, unrepresentative of the true tumor burden, uh, because obviously we haven't sampled the gland properly, and underestimates the size and also the grading of cancer. So transsectal ultrasound guided biopsies are, in a nutshell, not true representative of the tumor burden. So some of the limitations, again, that I've already told you of the transsectal ultrasound biopsies, and the other important thing is that, that when you do the transrectal biopsies and you take after that the prostate out and then the pathologist does a grading and often you will find that the grade has increased sometimes 54% of the patient's post prostatectomy. So this is a huge number. And this is what I said that the, it doesn't reflect the true tumor burden. And hence, sometimes when these biopsies are negative and patients are still having uh, persistent elevation of PSA levels, then they end up with having multiple biopsies. And obviously, the biopsies, they have their own complications. So you have a risk of bleeding, infection, urosepsis, uh, which is uh, not good for the patient. Recently, uh, this, this technique has been there for a while now, but it has been incorporated into the new pathway, which I'm going to talk about. And this is the transperineal biopsies. This is, again, the principle is the same, that you put a uh, probe in the rectum, uh, which will help you to localize where the prostate gland is, but then you place a grid, and this grid lies between the, where the scrotum is and the anus. And this is just to show you a magnified uh, sort of view of the grid, which has got holes in it, which are five millimeter apart. And the purpose of this grid is actually to take a systematic a number of multiple biopsy cores through the part of the prostate, which means that you are actually targeting the majority of the area uh, through this grid. And therefore, the yield was, would be better as opposed to a transrectal where you're taking random biopsies. But I'll talk about this transperineal template biopsy in a minute 
uh, with regards to the MRI. Um, so transplant biopsies, again, I've shown you the grid between risk proton and anus. We take the number of cores per sector, so four to five, which each sector, the number of biopsies are definitely more in this one from 24 to 40 maximum. And these are some of the indications that you, why you do the transplant biopsies in those patients who have previous negative transplant in patients who are put on active surveillance, those patients who have previous uh, treatment with radiotherapy. And it's in some places been considered as the primary biopsy strat strategy. But obviously, you, you have to give general anesthesia to the patient. Uh, you have to have the proper equipment. It has to be done in the um, OT or operation data. So it's a bit resource heavy and it needs more expertise to train the staff as well. The biopsy results are good because the risk of urosepsis, because you're not going through the rectum, taking the biopsies, uh, not through the rectum, so the risk of urosepsis and all the complications is less as opposed to transrectal biopsies. And uh, um, you will also see one of the important things that the one third of these, you know, the cases that we discussed is that one third of the patient will show significant cancer with the previous negative trust biopsy. So the Previously, with the trust, we have missed the cancer, but with the transparent and template biopsy, those cancers were picked up. So I'm going to talk about the multi-parametric MRI, which is now the entire talk and why we have changed and what was the previous pathway and what's the new pathway. So the multi-parametric MRI is nothing, is what I consider the, is a fancy name given to the MRI which already exists, but it does the trick, it does the job. So the multi-parametric MRI is the same MRI the patients are having for MRI of the head, so same equipment. But what we have done here is that, that we, we take T2-weighted imaging, which the tumor will appear actually as a low signal. Then we do the diffusion-weighted imaging, and the diffusion-weighted imaging is kind of a functional imaging. And what it means is that because the tumor cells are very compact and dense, so they tend to light up on these diffusion-weighted images, and they become much more discrete and much more prominent. And then in the same MRI, we also inject contrast. And we know that the tumor vessels are leaky because of the angiogenesis, so they will show early enhancement. So you, we use these three criteria to look at the prostate and to characterize the lesions over there, which gives us a better yield. And at the same time with this MRI, we can look at the uh, nodal disease. We also look at the bone marrow to exclude any localized uh, bone marrow infiltration within the pelvis. We can also use this MRI and we use the ultrasound and the MRI images actually, we fuse them together to take targeted biopsies. So I just want to show you some of the slides uh, for the MRI. So this is an axial um, uh, T2-weighted uh, image and it shows the peripheral zone of the prostate. Remember in the anatomy slide I've shown you, which is this bit here. Then you have the central gland. Obviously it looks a bit nodular because there is hypertrophy the fibromuscular stroma anteriorly, which appears of low signal. And very importantly, you can see the prostatic capsule there as this black line. When you come more posterior laterally, this is your rectum. You can see these two tiny dots, and these are actually the neurovascular bundles. Now, the neurovascular bundles are basically the nerves and the vessels which are clumped together. The importance of this neurovascular bundle uh, is that they carry the nerves, which basically uh, uh, control the erection. And because of their location, that they are located uh, very close proximity to the prostate, the prostate cancer can actually uh, extend outside the prostate and involve the neurovascular bundle. And therefore, it's very important for the surgeons to know that, that the neurovascular bundle is intact or not. That will have an implication on the treatment planning and also uh, the surgeons need to know because there are new techniques available, which is the nerve sparing surgery to spare the neurovascular bundle. Otherwise, the patient will end up with having, or the patient will be important. The next slide. So this is a slide of MRI, which shows the tumor. And as you can see here, again, this is part of the normal peripheral zone. And here there is a sizable tumor, which is of low signal. When we, I say low signal, it means it's black. And here you can clearly see the nodularity, which means that it has extended outside the capsule. So this is beyond the scope of this lecture, but uh, I would recommend you to go through with the TNM classification, which is the tumor, 
nodes and metastasis. And all the oncology scans are reported based on that TNM classification. So the prostate also have a TNM classification. It's a nomenclature which is used by uh, uh, radiologist, the oncologist, and also the pathologist, and it staged the disease. So this disease has extended beyond the capsule. It is T3A. On these slides again, you can see a, a quite a sizable tumor which has completely replaced the prostate gland. And on the left side, you can see the neurovascular bundle here, but on the right hand side, it's gone. It's invaded by the tumor. And this is again uh, one of the other uh, MRI which shows you these arrowheads as suspected areas of abnormal signal. But when you do the diffusion MRI, this is the ADC images, and you can clearly see the tumor which is more darker than the normal appearing prostate. This is an example of the same patient with the PET scan, and you can see the increased uptake in the PET that's ignored, it. that's something in the bladder but these areas are the foci of cancer within the prostate gland appearing bright or avidly uptaking the uh, FDG. And this is another slide which shows you the concept of diffusion imaging. Remember I told you that the tumor cells are compact. So on the diffusion rated images you see here, this is the compact cancer cells. And on this particular sequence, it is appearing very really bright. The rest of the prostate is very low. And then when you do the ADC, you can see the tumor as a black dot. So this is how it helps us in identifying the tumor and really identifying a significant disease within the prostate. And once we identify this, the surgeons can then go, they can do take a targeted biopsy and they can just hit the cancer. We don't need to find indolent cancers. So how good is the multiparametric MRI? So the negative predictive value of a clinically significant disease for prostate cancer, which means that if you have a test and the test will tell you that there is no cancer, right? That's the negative predictive value. And that for the MPMRI for a clinically significant disease is 90 to 95 percent in a center of excellence, which is quite good. It might be slightly lower in a district general hospital, which means that it depends on the skills of the reporting person um, in, in that place, but it's still pretty much good. So the, so the other question is that, that you know, if you have a negative MRI, which means that an MRI doesn't show anything uh, sinister, what are the chances of having still a cancer in the prostate? So the answer to that question would be that yes, you can still have uh, a, a low grade Greisen cancer, which is not shown by MRI. But you know, again, like I said, that the impact of that uh, uh, cancer on the mortality uh, the morbidity of the patient is very minimal. You can leave that cancer, it's not going to harm. So we're not really bothered about that. But there's a small percentage, which may be between five to eight percent of sometimes cancers can still be missed on MRI. But that's the thing that, you know, which is with every uh, uh, diagnostic modality. So we then move to the main uh, topic, which is why do we need to change the pathway and what is actually uh, wrong with our current pathway that we are actually screening uh, these patients with suspected prostate cancer. So what happens here is that a patient who has got a PSA level of more than four nanogram per ml is then referred from the GP to a urologist. And then he ends up by having a digital rectal examination followed by a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. Now remember all the things that I've told you previously about trust guided biopsy that how, you know, sometimes uh, uh, first, we, uh, I go back again to the PSA, that how unreliable the PSA can be. And then again, the trust guided biopsy that I've told you that it can miss significant cancer. So on this pathway, once the patient has got a trust biopsy, then they will do a staging MRI. And the issue of doing the staging MRI towards the end of this pathway is that you end up with having a lot of hemorrhage and bruising within the, MRI, within the prostate, and therefore the staging will be inaccurate. So the, this is the current pathway that we follow. And uh, in the next slide <clears throat> is the real question that why do we need to change? And a lot of things I've explained to you previously. So to, if I summarize, it is, I've shown you that it is a growing health burden because the average cost is 7,000. We are diagnosing more men 
because we do the PSA and we pick up and we think that this uh, rise in the PSA is because of the underlying cancer and hence we treat them more radically with either surgery or radiotherapy. And obviously there is a very small benefit, which is three to 5% of treating such endolent cancers over the uh, 10 to 15 years period. But in return, we are actually giving a huge harm to our patients with uh, incontinence, which can be 10 to 20%, which is a treatment related complication or impotence, which is around 50%. And some of them will also end up with having rectal toxicity in around 5%. So in a nutshell, the current pathway is basically fraught with errors. And we are again sampling based on PSA level. We are using transrectal biopsies with the hope that we'll find the cancer. And then we are picking up these insignificant cancers. So the new pathway is actually a paradigm shift in the way we look into the, in these patients. And uh, the, uh, uh, like I said, the here in the UK, uh, basically the pathway has changed. And now we emphasize on, not only on early detection of clinically significant cancer, but we also actually emphasize on better localization of the cancer, where it is located in the gland, and also rely uh, uh, on more accurate sampling of uh, the prostate. So with the imaging, uh, and precision biopsy, we can identify 90 to 95% of those tumors, unlike with the previous pathway, where we were randomly taking biopsies from the prostate, we were shooting in the dark, and we didn't have any clue about it. And in doing so, we are actually minimizing the risk of detecting insignificant cancers, which is very low with this new, new proposed pathway, which is just 2% of cases we will still pick up insignificant cancers. And then we are using the ultrasound and the MRI images to fuse the two images for the purpose of guided biopsies, which will increase our accuracy. There is also uh, uh, an interest in the focal therapy, but what we call the male lumpectomy. And what it is is that, that there are some treatment options available, which is image guided, such as HIFU, which is the high intensity focus ultrasound or cryotherapy. Uh, some of these treatments are only available in trial basis in a specialized centers in the UK. They're not available everywhere. But what it means is that with this kind of treatment, is a focal treatment uh, uh, which are with, with some selective criteria for these patients, and these treatment options can be provided to them, which are less side effects. So with the HIFU, which is a high-intensity focused ultrasound, what you do is that the same, you insert the ultrasound probe in that area, and you try to burn that area with the sound, uh, basically, beam. Um, and with the cryotherapy, you're trying to freeze those areas. And obviously with these, the new pathway that we have proposed, the complications, which is the incontinence, the impotence, rectal toxicity, are all less as opposed to with the transsectal ultrasound. And so where is the evidence? And obviously we're living in an era where we talk about uh, the uh, evidence-based practice. So we can't change the pathways. It has to be valid validated by research. And there are two landmark papers, which were all published here in UK. One of them was in Lancet, which is the Diagnostic Accuracy of Multiparametric MRI and Transrectal Biopsies in Prostate Cancer, which we call the PROMISE trial. And the other one is the Precision Study, which is a prostate evaluation for clinically important disease. And here in this paper, what they've done is that they have basically they have two arms of patient. One where they've said that we will just do a random biopsy and the other one we will the biopsies were done after reviewing the MRI. And in this slide, this is a very busy slide, but the take home message I just want from, uh, for you to uh, understand here is that, that if we do biopsies and before the biopsy we do an MRI, we can improve the detection accuracy of cancer to 93%. And the other important take home message is that, that the trust biopsies that we were doing Previously, right, we, if we do the uh, MRI, we will actually be able to uh, still detect more significant cancers by actually performing the MRI before we do the biopsies. So this is important. I will talk about a couple of other points later on when I will show you another slide. And 
This is just a briefly about the precision study, which I've already told you. So this slide is basically the comparison between the current pathway and the proposed pathway. And very briefly, if you see in the current pathway, uh, or, the, or the pathway that was there previously, patients suspected of prostate cancer, they were all of them will having a trisbapsy to begin with. And if the biopsy is negative for cancer, they were left alone. If it was positive, these patients will undergo treatment or some may undergo surveillance. Whereas in the new pathway, patients suspected of prostate cancer, will all of them will have MRI before even thinking of doing a biopsy. So you do the MRI and you see whether you found a lesion or not. If there is no lesion, no biopsy is required. If there is a significant lesion, you proceed with the biopsy. At this stage, you see between the difference between the two pathways, you're trying to cut down the number of biopsy. In this system, everybody is having biopsy. On this side, you're reducing the number. And that number is reduced to, according to the trials that I've shown you, is around 27%. So it's, it, it is, it's a good number that you're cutting down. And then further, on the, further on, if you do the biopsy and you find insignificant cancer, you just do put these patients on surveillance. You monitor them with, via their PSA and all that. But if you have a significant cancer, then you go ahead and you treat. So you are also reducing the number of cancer diagnosis, whereas previously, cancers of any grade or sort will then go ahead for treatment or maybe for surveillance. And then Obviously, the last bit is that you provide the treatment, so here you're reducing the treatment. So the advantages that you're getting with this is that you are, first of all, defining where the tumor is before you go in. You reduce the number of biopsies. You also reduce the number of cancer diagnoses because if it is insignificant, you don't want to tell them, tell the patient that you know you have got a cancer. And you reduce the treatment. So in summary, what is more important to, for you to understand the take-home message is that PSA is unreliable. So don't rely on PSA for the various reasons that I've already told you. It is quite variable. It can be positive in cancer patients, but it can even be negative in cancer patients. The transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies, they underestimate the tumor burden and they also detect insignificant disease. So the emphasis now is more on lesion detection or on finding a clinical significant cancer, and then to proceed with the biopsy. Pre-biopsy MRI should be done in all men who are suspected of having a prostate cancer. That is the bottom line. You can uh, either use a template, transparent template biopsy, or you can use a fusion biopsy, and there are other treatment options available, which are still under consideration in research, but they will be available sooner or later in the future to incorporate that into the treatment planning. And the last bit is that, that accurate Gleason grading is important for treatment planning and for better patient outcomes. So the slides should be read by somebody who's uh, basically uh, an expert in the field of uh, uh, reading um, the uh, prostate, uh, uh, or he's an expert uh, histopathologist. So that's all. Thank you very much. The things from this topic and try to understand uh, that uh, what has happened over the last uh, uh, couple of years in terms of prostate cancer, and you know uh, how we should be looking at these patients, what we should be doing in, and hopefully with this uh, topic, your concept of uh, prostate cancer emitting the modalities used and uh, what are the things that we need to incorporate into our existing protocols should have changed. Thank you so much. If you have any queries, um, um, I'm happy to share my email address as well. If you have any questions relating uh, to this talk, you can always get back to me and my email address is sakhan, so it is s-a-k-h-a-n khan 68 at hotmail.com. Thank you very much.